We invite you to take your Bibles once more and turn to the New Testament to the Gospel of John. John chapter 14. We're looking this morning at verses 7 through 11, but it has been a couple of weeks. Um, I was away uh, for, well, not for General Assembly, but, but we took a break that week uh, during General Assembly, and then I was away last weekend for a wedding, and Pastor Adam Ostella filled the pulpit, uh, for which I am grateful. But as we return to John, I want us to get our bearings. Um, we're picking up in verse 7, but I'm going to read verses 1 through 11. John 14, beginning in verse 1, I remind you that this again is the word of the living God. It is inspired, inerrant, and infallible. So let us give our attention to its reading. Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, that where I am you may be also. And you know the way to where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father, and it is enough for us. Jesus said to him, Have I been with you so long, and you still do not know me, Philip? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, Show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does his works. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, or else believe on account of the works themselves. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. Beloved congregation of the Lord Jesus Christ, as we take up our study once more in the Gospel of John chapter 14, I remind you that we are in the upper room with Jesus and his disciples. Jesus is preparing his disciples for his departure. He is preparing to appear before the earthly authorities. He is going to be condemned and sent to the cross to be crucified. All of this the disciples do not yet fully understand despite having the greatest teacher, and that's putting it very mildly, despite having very God of very God with them to teach them over and over and over again about the suffering that was to come, the disciples still struggled to see it. They struggled to understand how can this suffering fit into the glorious plan of God. As we've noted many times throughout our study of John's Gospel, we have that same struggle. We struggle to see how God fits all that we go through into His glorious plan. Indeed, these words given to us in John 14 help us to understand that God is, in fact, doing just that. Well, the reality is the disciples won't fully understand until Jesus fulfills the promise that he will make later in this chapter and elsewhere in John's Gospel to send the Comforter to them. And throughout this chapter, Jesus offers important truths that anchor their faith for the days that are ahead. We've seen this already in the opening verses of our chapter. We began our examination by considering the hope that Jesus gave them. Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. Jesus' opening words here in the upper room implies that there would be cause for their hearts to be troubled. In the midst of the storm that was to come, he wanted to make clear that he was with them through it. Jesus went on to speak about the place that he would prepare for them and that he would bring them to. And he told them that they knew the way. This led, of course, to Thomas asking his question, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? 
And throughout this chapter, what we're going to notice is that in each of their questions and in each of the moments, Jesus takes the opportunity to focus their attention, to focus their attention upon himself, for he is the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through him. Indeed, Jesus would ensure that those who are his would be with him in all eternity. And that brings us then to our passage this morning, beginning in verse 7. A familiar passage to us, I'm sure. Hopefully, by the time we're done, a comforting passage. For we encounter the disciples again wrestling with the same kinds of questions that we wrestle with. And when we do find that, it means that we are on the right track. It also reminds us that the faith delivered once for all to the saints is sufficient for our own days and our own troubles. Jesus continues to encourage his disciples, this time through his exchange with Philip, about how we can know God. Knowing God, that is the theme of our verses this morning. This is of the utmost importance to us. Indeed, when we gather for worship, we gather as as those who acknowledge that God is the one who is worthy of all adoration and praise. But this is one of the joys of our worship that we try to bring out in in, in our worship as we, we in a sense, ascend holy Mount Zion, confessing our sins and drawing near to God. Because in our worship, we are not kept at an arm's distance from our Heavenly Father. He gives Himself to us in Christ And if we have Christ, we have the Father. This is the challenge of our text today. This is the glory and the joy and the comfort of our text today. We can know God because we can know Christ. The knowledge that I'm speaking of isn't just head knowledge. It is our hope and our comfort. For the scriptures reveal to us that there is a personal God, a creator and ruler of the world. God, according to the Bible, is not just another name for the mighty processes of nature. He is not some part or aspect or even beginning of those processes. He is a free and holy person who created the process of nature by his own will and who is eternally independent of the universe that he has made. And yet, he calls us to know him. He makes a way for us to know him. And so if we want to know this God and to find comfort in him, then we must hear the words of Jesus today and the answer that he gives to Philip. So we begin and you have your outline before you in the bulletin if you would like to follow along in taking notes or just knowing where we are. We have simply two points this morning. First, knowing God and secondly, the the correction for the wrong desire that Philip has and we'll come to that in a moment. But first, the possibility of knowing God. To know God is not merely to know things about God, such as his character, but it is to experience his presence and his power. To know God is to be transformed by God. Indeed, we can say that human knowledge about God is a result of his own revelation of himself. Knowing God depends on him revealing himself to us. Indeed, as our confession says in chapter 7, that the distance between, between God and man is so great that although reasonable creatures owe God our worship, that we are unable, and I'm paraphrasing this, we are unable to do so, we are unable to draw near unless God condescends, and this he does by way of covenant, and what we know is that he reveals himself to us. Now, of course, it is, on the one hand, impossible to know God fully, The Apostle Paul declares in Romans 11 and verse 33, Oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable are his judgments and how inscrutable his ways. We also know that the heavens declare the glory of God and the sky above proclaims his handiwork. Day to day pours out speech and night to night reveals knowledge. There is no speech nor are there words whose voice is not heard. Psalm 19, verses 1 to 3. Creation testifies about who God is. 
Again, the Apostle Paul in Romans 1 and verse 20 says, For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. God reveals himself to us in his creation. God reveals himself to us further in his word. In his word, we, we understand what God is like. We understand who God is as holy. We understand who we are as sinners. It's in his word that we read of the sacrifices and the way in which we can draw near to God. Jeremiah 9 verses 23 and 24 say this. Thus says the Lord, Let not the wise man boast in his wisdom. Let not the mighty man boast in his might. Let not the rich man boast in his riches, but let him who boasts, boast in this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord who practices steadfast love, justice, and righteousness in the earth. For in these things I delight, declares the Lord. Knowledge of God is not just central, but it is attainable. And even though we can't know everything of God, we can know much of Him in creation, but especially in His Word. And in our text, it goes even further, even deeper, because we can know God through Christ. This is what Jesus says in verse 7, If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. And we want to consider Jesus' words, but first, we need to understand why He might be saying it this way. It comes across as a rebuke. I don't think it's a strong rebuke. It's, it's a correction. It's like when Jesus says, oh, you of little faith. And when you read those moments in the Bible, what you shouldn't read is Jesus just keeps throwing up his hands and I'm done with these disciples. No. Jesus understands who we are. He understands our weakness. And so this is a correction. But it is not a strong rebuke. Jesus is not discouraged, nor is he discouraging them. The purpose of the upper room discourse is to prepare them, and one of the ways they need to be prepared is to come to understand that they have not fully grasped who Jesus is. They have not fully grasped his relationship with God the Father. And this connection between Jesus and the Father is repeated throughout John's Gospel. We know this is one of the main purposes of this Gospel. In the very beginning, in John 1, G, uh, John tells us that the Word was God. Speaking specifically of Jesus, for the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. In chapter 5, Jesus has, has said that, that, that His Father is working and He is working. He sets Himself alongside of His Father. And we know that that's the right interpretation because the Jews seek to kill him and they say that they sought to kill him because he was calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. And Jesus removes all doubt, doesn't he, in chapter 10, that passage that looks at Jesus as the good shepherd that we studied over several weeks where Jesus said, I and the Father are one. And remember the purpose for Jesus saying, I and the Father are one. It was to assure those who heard, it was assured that his sheep would not be stolen away. And so Jesus wants his disciples and he wants us to understand and to know him that we might know the Father also. In fact, Jesus says from now on, you do know him and have seen him. Now I want us to understand here, there's this interesting interplay that's going on here in this passage between knowledge and sight. Jesus says you do know him and have seen him. Because knowing Christ is seeing God. When Jesus says from now on, it doesn't necessarily mean in that very moment, but Jesus is going to the cross after his ascension will pour out the Holy Spirit on his people. The hour that has been spoken of in John's gospel from the very beginning that was not yet come has finally come in our text and it would be a decisive moment in redemptive history where salvation, the salvation of God's people, would be fully accomplished in the work of the Son. 
This is one of the reasons why we can hear the assurance of forgiveness and find great joy in it because it's not as though we have to figure out how we need to do the rest of our salvation, that God has done all he can and we're supposed to fill in the blanks. Our salvation is completely and fully accomplished in the work of the Son. And so Jesus says that from now on, you do know him and have seen him. And we don't want to miss the mystery of these words. There is such a close and mysterious union between the Father and the Son that he who sees and knows the Son sees and knows the Father. J.C. Ryle comments, he says, the whole difficulty of the verse arises from the extreme mysteriousness of its subject. The relationship or the relation between the eternal Father and the eternal Son and the eternal Spirit, who, while three persons, are one God, is precisely one of those things which we have no minds to take in and no language to express. We must often be content to believe and reverence it without attempting to explain it. This only we may lay down with certainty as a great canon and maxim. The more we know of Christ, the more we know of the Father. After all, he is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. Hebrews 1 and verse 3. 2 Corinthians 4 and verse 6, that God who said, let light shine out of darkness, has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Speaking of this relationship between the Father and the Son, J. Gresham Machen writes, that doctrine is a mystery. No human mind can fathom it. Yet, what a blessed mystery it is. The Christian's heart melts within him in gratitude and joy when he thinks of the divine love and the condescension that has thus lifted the veil and allowed us sinful creatures to look into the very depths of the being of God. This is what Jesus is speaking of here. He is teaching us how it is that we know the Father. We know the Father through the Son. And as an aside, this will always be true. In eternity, in the glorious new creation, we will behold our Savior face to face. The Father who is invisible will remain such, but we will know Him even as we are fully known. Well, you can imagine that this receives some pushback from the disciples. I mean, it probably already receives pushback in our own hearts and minds, doesn't it? We're talking about mystery. We're talking about the inability to fully fathom and grasp it. And yet there are plenty of religions out there that will say, no, 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 let's get rid of the mystery. We can just logic our way to it. Such as the the rationality of the Arians who brought Jesus down from divine status and made him merely the highest of creation. We find it in our own day among Mormons and Jehovah's Witnesses. We find it among Unitarians. We find it even among Christians who struggle to understand the doctrine of the Trinity. And I'm not here to tell you that we're going to suddenly solve that struggle. What I'm saying is, it is of the utmost importance that we understand who Jesus is in relation to the Father because it is through Christ that we see God. But again, as I said, if that struggle is in your heart and mind, even to a small extent, you can surely understand where Philip goes. For following Jesus' words, Philip asks for something quite natural. He wants Jesus essentially to prove his words. Philip said to him in verse 8, Lord, show us the Father, and, and it is enough for us. Isn't that nice of Philip? Jesus will only have you do one more thing. Out of everything you've done, just give us a glimpse of the Father. We're not told Philip's motive in making this request. Perhaps he's like Moses in Exodus chapter 33. Remember after, after Moses comes down from Mount Sinai and after the tablets have been broken, uh, uh, um, um, then Moses, after wrestling over the matter of the golden calves, he, he encounters again God and he says to God in verse 18 of chapter 33, please show me your glory. Show me your glory. 
And God said, I will make all my goodness pass before you and will proclaim before you my name, the Lord, and I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious and I will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. But, he said, you cannot see my face for man shall not see me and live. So perhaps Philip's request is like Moses' desire to see God's glory. Or perhaps it's recorded for us to show how little clear knowledge the apostles had of Jesus' nature. How little they realized that he and the Father were one. Whatever sense we put on these words, I encourage us, we must not judge Philip too harshly. His request is a natural one. Who among us wouldn't want just a glimpse of glory so that we can endure the trials we face on earth? 16th century theologian Philip Melanchthon remarked that the petition represents the natural wish of, every, of man in every age. Men feel an inward craving everywhere to see God. This, of course, is the reason why there is so much idolatry in the world. This is why idolatry creeps into our own hearts. We all have this desire to see God. And what Jesus is doing is he is directing us again to himself. We desire to see God, and if we would see God, we must know Jesus Christ. And so Jesus offers correction for Philip's wrong desire. Look at verse 9. Jesus said to him, Have I been with you so long that you still do not know me, Philip? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. We can say that first Jesus corrects Philip's wrong request or wrong desire through his words. In other words, saying that, that through the words of Jesus, we see the Father. His words are a correction here, even a rebuke, but I want us to understand the tone that comes across. And I've tried to represent this from the very beginning of this sermon. In Psalm 103, in Psalm 103, verses 10 to 14, we read that God does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his steadfast love toward those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. As a father shows compassion to his children, so the Lord shows compassion to those who fear him. For he knows our frame. He remembers that we are dust. When we think of Philip's request and Jesus' response, what I want us to see is Christ's compassion. Again, Jesus doesn't throw up his hands and say, good grief, how long am I going to put up with you? No, he answers. And maybe there's a sense of, of, of sorrow in his voice. Maybe there's, maybe there's a rebuke, a mild rebuke that we all need to have our minds drawn away from the things of this world and from this, this, this tendency that we have to, to, to demand that the eternal God prove himself to us. And to simply see Christ. Philip wants to see the Father, but Jesus makes clear that they have. For Jesus reveals the Father. I've already alluded to this, but in 1 Timothy 1 and verse 17, the Apostle Paul says that, that, that God is the invisible God, the only God. We see God through Christ. We see God through Christ. Now, you might want to think a little bit more about what Jesus is saying here. He says here that, that uh, whoever has seen me has seen the Father. In the Greek, there are actually three different words for seeing. In fact, John uses all of them in his gospel. In chapter 20, verses 4 to 8, we read about how, 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 how the empty tomb, or they learn of the empty tomb, and so they run to the empty tomb. And in chapter 20, in verse 5, we read of Peter stooping in to look. He saw the linen clothes. I'm oh, sorry, not Peter, but, 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 but um, the other one who outran Peter, John. Stooping in, look, he saw the linen clothes. This is the word blepo in the Greek. It, it, it makes reference to a simple observation. He saw something and he reported it. Reported the facts of it. But then we read in verse 6 that then Simon Peter came following him and went into the tomb. He saw the linen clothes lying there. Interestingly, John uses a different word. There he uses the word 
theoreo, which is where we get the English word to theorize or theory from. And it carries with it the idea of observation beyond mere sight, maybe connecting the dots. John simply saw the linen cloth lying there. Peter saw and began to put it together. But then we read in verse 8, Then the other disciple who had reached the tomb first also went in, and he saw and believed. This is yet another word, horao. It carries the idea of understanding, of experience, to see with comprehension. And the word that Jesus uses, going back to our text, that if you've seen me, you've seen the Father, it's the word horao. That's why he keeps using the term to know and to see interchangeably. It's not a mere knowledge. It's not mere, merely looking at and, and, and seeing the facts. It's not a mere knowledge that affects the mind, but one that reaches to the will and to the experience as well. Jesus goes on and says, How can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words I say to you, I do not speak of my own, on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does his works. Jesus' words, obviously, the focus of this first sub-point that he, focuses, that, that he looks at. The words that I say to you, I do not speak of my own authority. Again, echoing back to what we've been studying throughout John's Gospel, that Jesus' words are the words that the Father is speaking in the Son. Remember in John chapter 7 when the Pharisees were angry with Jesus and they sent a horde of soldiers to go and arrest him. And they come back and, and, and they're empty-handed. And the Pharisees, they're just bewildered. Why, why? We sent you to arrest him. Why didn't you do it? And they answered him, no one ever spoke like this man. Jesus' words, we can say, are essential. In his words, we see the Father. But also through the works of Jesus, we see the Father. Again, there at the end of verse 10, the Father who dwells in me does his works. We can say that God's words and works, they, they, or God's words are his works. After all, he said, let there be light. And dads, surely you've done this before, where you said, let there be light, and you've flipped the switch. And of course, your children didn't go, oh, no. But see, we have to flick the switch. When God said, let there be light, there was just light. It appeared. His word is his work. We need to turn the light on. God simply spoke light into existence. And God's works are multifaceted. They reflect his attributes of power, love, justice, mercy, and wisdom. Indeed, one of the primary works of God is the act of creating the world and everything in it. In Genesis 1 and 2, we read about God's creative activity, bringing forth the heavens, the earth, and all living creatures, all by His Word, by divine fiat. Moreover, God continues to uphold all of creation. His providential, we can say His providential work that we see all around us, His ongoing guidance and care and sustenance of the world and all of its inhabitants. The grass that grows is at God's command. The scriptures teach us that God is actively involved in upholding and governing creation, working all things together for His purposes. Indeed, God's providence, His work, is seen in His provision of daily needs. And so if we have seen Christ... We have seen the Father, not just in His words, but in His works. For after all, in Hebrews 1.3, when it says that He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of His nature, it goes on to say, and He upholds the universe by the word of His power. God's work of creation, providence, even redemption, all of it focuses on the person and work of Jesus Christ. It is in Christ that we see God. It is through Christ that we know God. And the more that we learn of Christ, the more we grasp of God. 
This is why, beloved, we can read the scriptures, we can spend our lives praying, we can study theology, and by the end of it, we will have but scratch the surface of our knowledge of Christ and of God. And yet what we can know is of such comfort to us. What we can know provides great hope to us. For it is Christ who redeems his people, and he has always been the one to redeem his people. Jude 1.5 says this, I want to remind you, though you once fully knew it, that Jesus, who saved the people out of the land of Egypt, Jesus, who saved the people out of the land of Egypt, it is Christ who has been redeeming the people of God from the very beginning. It is Christ in his full theophanic glory that Moses desired to see. It is Christ who reveals himself to us in his word. Through the words of Jesus, we see the Father. Through the, word, through the works of Jesus, we see the Father. And lastly, just simply through Jesus, we see the Father. In verse 11, believe me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. Or else believe on account of the works themselves. The mysterious union between the persons of the Godhead is at the core of what Jesus is saying here. And this underscores the profound unity, love, and interdependence within the Godhead. The Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, forever dwelling together as Trinity, revealed to us through Jesus Christ. And this, again, is a great comfort, help, and hope for us. J.C. Ryland's commentary again, he says, Let us, however, take comfort in the simple truth that Christ is very God, a very God, equal with the Father in all things, and one with him. He who loved us and shed his blood for us on the cross and bids us trust him for pardon is no mere man like ourselves. He is God over all, blessed forever and able to save to the uttermost the chief of sinners. Though our sins be as scarlet, he can make them white as snow. He that casts his soul on Christ has an almighty friend, a friend who is one with the Father and very God. So how can we know God? We know him through Christ. How can we know Christ? We know him through his word through his word and spirit, through prayer, and through the sacraments. This is what God has given to us, the word, the sacraments, and prayer. It is through the word that we understand who God is, that we understand who Christ is, what he has done. Think of what Peter says in 2 Peter chapter 1 when he compares everything that he experienced, the experience that he had on the Mount of Transfiguration, he says this, for when, we, for when he received honor and glory from, the, from God the Father, and the voice was borne to him by the majestic glory, this is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. We ourselves heard this very voice born from heaven, for we were with him on the holy mountain. Indeed, we might think that that, that, that would be what we want, just like Philip, show us the Father and it is enough for us. Just one glimpse of glory. But what does Peter say? And we have something more sure. More sure than the experience. More sure than the glimpse of glory. We have the prophetic word, he says, to which you will do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining in a dark place until the, dawn, and, until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Knowing this, first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture comes from someone's own interpretation. For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Our knowledge of God is found in His Word. Our knowledge of God, especially of Christ and what He has done and how we can know the Father so closely is found in looking to His Word in calling upon Him in prayer as well as in partaking of the sacraments. As the psalmist bids us in Psalm 34, O taste and see, that the Lord is good. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. The knowledge of God is possible. The knowledge of God is for us, is in Christ. But maybe you are here today and you still struggle with that. Maybe your doubt, maybe your knowledge has always seemed to be, be, be interrupted by doubts. 
Jay Packer helpfully writes this, what matters supremely is not in the last analysis the fact that I know God, but the larger fact which underlies it, the fact that he knows me. I am graven on the palms of his hands. I am never out of his mind. All my knowledge of him depends on his sustained initiative in knowing me. I know him because he first knew me and continues to know me. He knows me as a friend, one who loves me, and there is no moment when his eye is off me or his attention distracted from me, and no moment, therefore, when his care falters. The knowledge of God is essential to our comfort that we might know the one who knows us, the one who cares for us, and Jesus says that we know the Father because we know the Son.